might be on its own as sort of description of code. Uh, it's when you actually going to run it for the bad things to happen. So, inside the virtual machine, the most the important structure, well, arguably, is the tagged value, which, from a logical point of view, is one of 12 things. Well, on the right hand corner, you'll recognize that the first nine is kind of fundamental types of the lower, and the three on the bottom are kind of internal things that you don't see them for that. And so, this guy is everywhere. The C stack is an array of T values. Local variables are all T values. People keep values are all T values. So, it's you know, the fundamental thing that defines the lower types of T. But the actual reality is a little more complicated. What you actually tend to get, at least in flight one, is a 64 bit payload, which is one of the several things, and then a 32 bit tag, which is one of the several things, and then perhaps some padding on, on the end. So in five, two, it's a little different with man packing, but you know, at least in five, one, this is what we're looking at. And the problem, of, the issue that I like to exploit is finding ways of getting the tags and the payloads to not matching up. But when you think of one type, but in fact it's some other type, and therefore you get the wrong payload out, and that leads to some rather interesting behavior. <laughs> <laughs> so, I said the C stack is a very key device. So, here's the source code from the raw get function from the C API. So it takes a little say in the starting next. The first line what it does is to know that starting next to a T value pointer, fair enough. Second line, that calls the TT as table. It checks whether the tag is the table tag. And then API check, you know, does what you might expect to do. On the third line, that calls the H value is pulling out the table pointer payload. And then the rest is doing a table and the and replacing the top of the stack with the value. So you'd think things couldn't go too badly here, except that API check call, unless you compile it with assertions turned on, won't actually do anything. So unless you could change the default settings, this code won't do that check, and therefore whatever something next to you give it, it will put out the table point of payload and do stuff with it. So you could plausibly imagine with somehow passing a, a string to do a raw get and then the string point of payload. And of course you can control the contents of a string because you can make them do whatever you want. And therefore you can kind of create a table effectively with whatever internal pointers you want and you can pass it and pass that kind of kind of string to this and it'll kind of treat it as a table and do nasty stuff. You know, it's a little, you know, that exact scenario doesn't quite work, but it's the same kind of case. Um, so, as a general note, if you're using the CAPI and you're calling either this or the raw set or the next or raw set i or raw get i, do not ever pass something that's not table because you may not enjoy the consequences of that. <laughs> but, um, so then, here's the table of sort from the CAPI. And the first thing it does is check that it's like index one in the table. And then it goes on and does some stuff, and then it does a raw get on that starting index one. So again, you'd probably expect that this should be okay, because it's checked it is a table, so it should still, still be one. But the important is what I've missed out in this analysis. In that if you give it a comparison function, it will call that comparison function and interleave the call to the table stuff. And if, for example, you could call debug.setLocal from within that comparison function, you could overwrite starting next one with something other than a table. And it will pass up. And with, with my code, you can kind of emulate the debug library to some extent. And you can do kind of similar things, so you can overwrite that starting index from within the comparison function without actually needing the debug library to be there which is kind of beginning to get why things can go bad. So we also begin to see here that if we do enable API checks, then this particular problem will be solved. So one of the other things you can do, you know, if you do want to know 
like there, you just type that you can't just say the argument. But they're just, you can do the part of the API sessions to turn it on, which will catch this case, but there are other cases that it won't catch, like the following. So here on the left, we've got the source code to the poorly, and on the right, we've got the white code and white code for it. And so what's going to go on here is a very similar case of ignoring the, the tag and the value and just taking the payload. So to get it over to kind of boring, the full cut instruction will check that the three values that you loaded are in fact numeric values, and if they're not, it will throw an error. And then the for loop instruction then assumes you still got numbers. Because if you're doing source code, then you can't change the loop control stuff. It's going to fix when you load it. And therefore, the, this model of checking it in the for prep and then assuming in the for loop is perfectly fine and perfectly safe. But if you're writing pure or bytecode, then you can issue a for loop instruction on things that aren't numbers. And you'll happily put out the number payload. Or, which is fairly convenient, because numbers are generally the largest of the payloads. I mean, at least on 32 bits, they're 64 bits wide, and everything else is 32 bits wide. And on 64 bits, 4 bits, system, everything is the same width. So, you know, by taking things out as, as numbers, you can know, get the kind of pointers that are internal to the state without having to kind of find some other way of getting the pointed out. So, you know, if you had a table, you can you could call two string lines to get the pointer out, it would generally tell you. But if you wanted the pointer to a string, then you couldn't pull that out through any other means. And this becomes a very useful way of putting out things like pointers to, to strings, which you can then move on to you know, make internal pointers to each other and then pass off to your table stuff. So, that's kind of another case of where things can go wrong. Uh, Next example, I want to go through how function calls work in the virtual machine. That's helpful in understanding some further context of things. So again, on the left we've got some source code that calls my favorite function. And we're going to look at what the stack looks like during that call. So, if we can get the state of just before table of sort is called, in R0 we're holding the local table. In R1, we've got the function on call, and in R2 and R3, we've got the parameters watch. All set up. So, we then make the call, and then in C land, so we've got numeric stack indices, 1, 1, and 2, rather than register indices. But I mean, the stack itself hasn't changed, we're just going to switch our view of it. And you know, then the table sort doesn't work, it decides that it's going to pull out two things from the table, from the pair which will minus 4 or minus 5. Then it's going to call the comparison function. So it's push the function minus 3 and the parameter minus 1 and minus 2, as you would expect if you've done any work with C API. And it makes the call. Again, when you do the call, so that doesn't change. You just switch back to the real mode. So again, you've got the most of the side things are the numeric ones. So the comparison function does its work. It's going to be false. It will Returns, so we're back in CNAN again, we have our results in the top of the stack, and it does some work and it then returns as well. And we can have left after the whole lot here. So the first important thing to note is that you know, all the values that we have used during the computation are still there on the stack. And if you're working in Lua mode, the bytecode can read any of the first 255 stack slots after the function base. So if you're writing bytecode in, in this kind of scenario, you can go off and read anything that's sitting around on the stack. So if the function that you call wasn't the people that sort, but was something more sensitive, you could have put some interest, interesting stuff on the stack during, it, during its work, then you could go off and read that. For a shame, it would be kind of pretty bad, and then maybe it would have put the virtually table on the stack while you weren't looking and then you go and read that and have some fun. So again, that's uh, a rather important point. Yeah, we're sort of merged into our values. It's kind of closely related to this 
notion of kind of punishment balls going to take in place on the south side is up funded, it's in how they decide to work. So in a typical case of sourcing on the left and what it looks like on the right, so in, in the middle column we've got what the south looks like, we've got the value 10 on top, and then we've got our function. And what our function is, is a, a, a kind of point off so a kind of function structure, which gives another the so the point is you have the list of five periods that is going to run. And you've also got some, in this case, one up value pointer, which is just a T-value pointer. And in this case, pointing back to somewhere else on the stack. In this case, back to local. But if we're writing microcards and source code, we can point that up value to anywhere that we want to point it to. And in particular, we can point to some of the road out to do a function call in. So, if we were out to the hospital, we could point it at where one of the arguments is going to end up. And then when we call up that function, we can then read from that up value to emulate the demo library and it's going to get such local value of functions. So, in a nutshell, that's how Viper is emulating the demo library. So, just to recap on things that it can do which are nasty. We've got the you know, four loops of treating English numbers when they're not. If we're in 5.2, we've got the set list instruction, which you know, treats things as tables when they're not, or they need to be tables. We've got the set of emulating the debug library of either kind of leaving locals that which are being left over from a function call, or kind of pointing out values at the places where they shouldn't be pointing. And by taking advantage of these things we can then buy title in the C API. Again, there's a bunch of table stuff in 5.1 because these subjects can only have meaning for the tables. They don't do these kind of clever, well, these kind of really thorough checks of whether they actually have tables. So we can then have a similar case in 5.2 where we get such user value functions because they are only meaningful for, for user data and therefore assume they've got user data. And if they don't, then, you know, well, things happen. So, given that those are the kind of things which can go wrong in general, or at least those are the things I'm aware of that can go wrong, that could be further stuff I've yet to find, what can you do about it? I've already kind of mentioned, if you don't extract bytecode in the first place, we can check the first byte, and if it's S or we can just throw the code away. If you're in 5.2, the load function has a third parameter controlling whether you want to load text or what or bytecode. So if you just pass C for text rather than B C for bytecode and text, then again that will refuse to load bytecode. And that will solve the problem there. So if you're working with the C API rather than the newer standard library, then you can still have to go through the first way. Because the third parameter is only present in the uh, Library rather than the C area. And if you, so, whereas if you do have to do bytecode without the last two options, if you have some control over your compile process, you can do something with the API check macros, turn them on, but you know, it's uh, only a partial thing. So the third option, which is kind of, since I've played with this, is kind of, can we do any stuff in analysis of this bytecode? to determine whether it does any of these things which I decided are unsafe. And uh, the answer is yes, effectively. And we're going to look at how that works and what we do. So we said that violating types options in the version sheet was one of the kind of bad things that it could do. So one kind of blunt force approach to kind of solving this problem we need to go through and say, out of every instruction in the FICO list, and for every possible stack slot, build up some set of, kind of possible types that you could have in that stack slot. And when we come to an instruction that kind of assumes the type, we can then check whether what we've got as you know, such possible types lines up with its expected types, which you know, would be a kind of one way of solving this. Uh, for the second thing that we've decided is bad, uh, so for doing things that have been left over from a function call, what we want 
to do is calculate whether we can even use a particular stack set or register. And so we can even say that to start with, only the function parameters are going to save the read from. I mean, anything you can write to the side, you can write it on the car, but you know, we said that you, know, you can't read from a web register until after you've written for it first, otherwise you're going to do so. And again, when you make a function call, it kind of clears this flag on the stack so that we're doing a function call in. And that you know, effectively works as a way of saying that you're only going to read what you've put in places. And if similar to that is determining if a particular stack slot can have an up value pointing to it. Because if it could have an up value point pointing to it, then you want to make sure that you know, other functions you know, don't see that in the front of their stack frame. So you can again go through, so for every stack slot and every white place, decide if it could or could not be an up value, again, you know, assuming that on the worst side of you know, it, it might be enough value, maybe, and say it could be. And then you say the function calls cannot happen if they could overlap with one of these with possible malicious points. And this kind of works. Um, it's not particularly fast because we're going to do stuff for every stack swap and for every position. So it kind of works out at kind of only just about faster than loading source code. You know, one of the possible reasons for not being like it in the first place is that it's meant to be a lot faster than living source code. So this approach from a kind of security point of view probably works, but from a kind of practical point of view it's not the you know, best approach that you might like. But still that's sort of a look at it in a slightly more detail to see exactly you know, what stuff is going on. So on that from a kind of fairly odd function. That's something ridiculous, but that's the point. And on the right, you have what the white bridge map might look like in some of its pseudo white bridge form. So we can put up a list of instructions for the test and that then jump in the load and jump in the load and then return, which is kind of fairly crude. So if you can do some work on that, you can return it into a call tree or a graph of what does what and what goes where. And by going through this graph and then annotate it with some types. So if you're doing it for R0 here, before the test, R0 is holding the input parameter, and therefore it could be in any type you wanted. And after the, the load, it would contain in one type, and therefore you would return it would contain either the number or string. So in this kind of case, that's going to be clear. I mean, if you've got kind of loops in your white code, then things are slightly more fun. Because you, know, you can't do it in a single one pass through, you have to assume that the type is going to be this set and loop through and you grow your set just to loop through and see what could, could happen. And uh, that could give you another reason why this isn't particularly efficient, because it can't do it in one pass, at least not in general. It could take several passes and then will lead you to much so. But fundamentally, this, uh, this annotation process, both for types and for readability and for up values, works in graphing this way and solves the problem. Or it solves much of the observed of the problem. So, if I having been thought about this approach for a while, I actually decided you know, we can do better. Uh, so we can run the, the, the blunt approach or take the more subtle approach. So again, the same two, two problems that you identify as things that you can have in the white code. First of all, the type assumptions. So the the blunt approach is cannot get this set of types and kind of everything at all times. But that's kind of a slightly overkill. Because we've only actually seen two cases where this can kind of be fair. So in, in 5.1, we've got to be controlled variables as kind of being. We don't want them to be touched other than when they need to be. So if, if we kind of enforce that constraint rather than the kind of calculating set of types constraint, then that should be a lot faster to calculate and check. And secondly, in 5.2, you've got the set list instruction as seen in the, the tables. That's been slightly harder to check in this particular model. 
So my advice in that scenario is to go back to the 5-1 approach when I set this we'll, we'll check the type of it's too for, for this thing. And, and if it was fast enough in, in, in 5-1, then you can put it back in where you want to be sort of careful on security. Seems like you've a fairly fair trade-off. And that would solve some of the first problem if we, if we could do that properly. And then for our second problem, again, the, the bunch approach was to sort of decide for every stack stock, whether it was readable and whether it was an upvalue. But I mean, that's a lot of information to store if you don't need to. And actually, you know, due to the way that the kind of built-in code generator converts from source code to bytecode, we can kind of assume that all bytecode is going to be fairly similar to what the, the built-in code generator would give you. And therefore, we can kind of do better. And rather than kind of classifying each stack stock, we can kind of break the stack into three kind of portions. So the stuff that contains a local variable, the stuff that's going to contain a temporary value that we're using as part of computation, and the rest of the stuff which is unused. And so we can talk about this kind of local region due to the debug information which is inside the bytecode, which kind of effectively says that for this duration of the bytecode, this particular stack stop is a local. So as long as you have to strip out that debug stuff, you can calculate you know, which versions are going to be local, so which time, which gives you that region of the stack. Uh, the next kind of assumption that we're making, or that I'm making this particular approach, is that temporary values on the stack are kind of only used during the evaluation of a kind of single statement. So if you do one statement that does some stuff, you know, it might update some local, it might make some function calls. But then after it's finished doing what it's doing, before the next statement does stuff, and if there are no temporary values left over on the stack, all the all, they're left there, but we don't need them. They might as well be unreadable or kind of unused parts of the stack. Maybe there are a few issues with that assumption, it doesn't always hold, but it's kind of, you can even make it work. And the rest of the stack we have is unused. So we can plug this local region by this temporary region. It's, um, it'll always kind of grow by one. So whenever the evaluation of the statement needs a new temporary, it'll kind of use the next available stack slot. So we kind of grow this region up. And, but then we need to know when one statement ends and when one begins. So we can kind of do that by looking at forward and backward jumps in the bytecode. So we can kind of say that as long as the code doesn't jump around too much, or, or if it doesn't jump around at all, then you're kind of in a list of sequential stuff. And then we're going to build up these regions and kind of store them they can't go all, all, all weird. And it's only kind of jumps that could tell you when you did have a change in something happening. So the backwards jumps in white code is to be due to a you know, loop type structure. So you do some stuff in the blue body and then what was done while you jump back up to start the loop. And so the backward jumps you do that, you know, backward jumps are in this case only happen at the between one instruction and the other and then we'll let you be temporaries. Forward jumps are slightly more interesting. I mean, the common case might be an if statement, if you have forward jumps over two branches of, of the if, uh, which in that case would be kind of between statements. But also the boot, the and and or operators, because they do short circuit evaluation, also leads to forward jumps. So in that case, we can't quite say that a forward jump is a change in one from one statement to the next statement. But the things are still kind of okay, because in that kind of case, both branches can kind of calculate after a certain point, and they're like calculating to get a certain value in a certain place on the stack. And when those two kind of branches of the and or branches of the or combine again, they only kind of need up to their common place. So even if one can kind of use a lot more temporaries than the other, once they combine again, 
then you use that to put the minimum of the two branches. So in that case as well, you can get away with this the calculation of this region. And it's kind of only on the when we reach construction that could be reached from a backward jump, we have to say that we have to kind of erase it from a temporary region and assume that it's empty again and we start building it up. And this approach again seems to work. I mean I'm not from a personal point of view, it seems less clean because it's been making various assumptions about how the white code looks and that kind of thing. But I mean, from the, the large body of source code that I tested on, it seems to hold. And I could probably you know, delve through the code generator and make myself fairly happy that these assumptions that we can always hold and therefore make this approach viable. You know, the upside of this approach is that it's a lot faster. It's kind of only just slower than loading white code rather than being only just faster than loading source code, which is quite nice. And in particular, we can you know, do this in a very quick kind of two pass, two passes over white code. One pass to find the kind of backward jumps, and then one pass to you know, calculate these regions and track them. And also, we are only kind of holding you know, two values for each position in. Quite good. We're going to say how big are each of these regions and how are any of these locals that you put control stuff. Which is a lot less to keep track of compared to kind of every stack source possible. So A we go in two parts as well, we multi pass, and B we can hold a lot less information, and therefore we can get faster analysis of the bike code albeit with a small caveat of putting table type checks back in at runtime. So it's the code will run ever so slow likely so. But I mean, that table type check is fairly fast. And it's only done during table constructors and it's only done once for every 50 numeric indices in your table constructor. So I mean, it's not a big thing. It's worth mentioning this is where it does have a very slight runtime cost. But other than that, quite good. So that's kind of the theory of what can go on. From a practical point of view, people are going to say what you can do about the, the problem. So one of the lot libraries that I'm working on is called LBCB, you can find it on Google Code. And it's designed as a kind of verifier for 5.2 bytecode. I mean, having gone through this, I like I'm going to the end of the talk, and you know, I realized that actually 5.1 one might be also a problem. And so I made in due course I basically work with 5.1 as well. But for I mean, now it's 5.2 only. And it fulfills with two functions which are fairly simple to use. The verify function takes some bytecode as a constraint and tells you is it safe or is it not. And then the load function is a quickly drop in or replacement of my choose load function. It takes exactly the same arguments, but the load will take an end from on, on the end of my two. And it goes through the same process as what load does. And at the same time as load is loading the pi code, it is verifying it. So you can have both things loading it and checking it. And it, you know, it's designed as a drop in replacement. Although it doesn't do things like load file or load string, it's mm -hmm. just the low level load file function. But it, I mean, it, as has been said, you want to make these things easier for people, and I like the same drop in thing should be fairly simple. You know, as long as it works in pipe one, if I go back to big pipe one. And so with that, the garden is important actually do, right? I think I should shut up and let you ask any questions.
I mean, if an I have a sample code that's sitting around, but you give it a string containing code for your machine, and it will run it. So, yeah, it's fully working. Working out. situation where you have uh, no control over your bytecode, so that somebody could insert malicious bytecode, but you do have control and don't want to lose control about anything that the virtual machine could then touch or do. So my scenario for this is more people who haven't realized that this is a factor that they should do something with. Uh, 
that was. So the size of the executable with the first approach, that's a new force viral check compared to the dual that has a compiler. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I'm check it on late. I mean, I think it probably. Hey, DLL, you can compile it with the right way for the current hash type stuff, or is that an order of size? I mean, if you can take out the parser and the code generator, you know, you're probably looking at a similar order of size, but then beyond that, I can't say for sure yet. This is the thing
that would be a better way of doing it. I mean, it's, it's, it's how people do it on units and years. You protect the thing by not protecting far away, not inside. The more you're inside, the more you're in the risk of details that day, is that me too, me too, no? Yeah, yeah. So you're in so a situation where, 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 no, I mean, no, I mean, I would use this library, 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 but you could, yeah, but you could protect the users, protect the from, users from others. Yeah. So 